Welcome to Socials with the Saints. Are you looking for hope and inspiration? Grab a cup of tea or your favorite beverage and spend some time with us as we meet role models throughout church history and discuss how they can help us in our daily pilgrimage of life. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to Socials with the Saints. Our mission is to inspire you in your daily pilgrimage of life by introducing you to the communion of saints. I'm Angela Ciolana, Media Coordinator for Pilgrim Center of Hope, a Catholic ministry founded in 1993 with a mission of helping you walk your journey of daily life in hope with Christ in the church. Socials with the Saints are opportunities to learn from role models of faith and from one another for fellowship, prayer, and receiving spiritual tools. Today, we'll be shining a light on an American saint, Mary Catherine Drexel. We're recording this podcast as a resource for those of you who could not attend our in-person Socials with the Saints gathering. You're most welcome to join us on the third Thursday of every month in San Antonio, Texas. Visit pilgrimcenterofhope.org. That's pilgrimcenterofhope.org for more information about our in-person Social with the Saints gatherings. Now, let's learn about St. Mary Catherine Drexel, born November 26, 1858, and died March 3rd, 1955. Banker Francis Drexel, the brother of J.P. Morgan's business partner, and his wife Hannah welcomed their second child into the world, Catherine Mary, in 1858. Only five weeks afterward, Hannah passed away. Grief-stricken Francis entrusted the care of their first daughter Elizabeth and baby Kate to a brother and sister-in-law. In 1860, Francis married Emma, the daughter of a French immigrant, and they brought the girls home with them. The couple welcomed a third daughter in 1863 and soon purchased an estate just outside Philadelphia, naming it after St. Michael. It was not far from the mother house of the Sisters of the Sacred Heart, where Mrs. Emma Drexel's sister, Mother Louise Bouvier, lived for some time. Little Katie Drexel and her sisters would visit frequently with their mother. The Drexels taught their children that money was entrusted to them for the care of others, and they set this example as notable philanthropists. Three days a week, the girls saw their mother distribute food, clothing, shoes, medicine, or rent money to any person who came to their door. She also hired an assistant who visited tenements, assessed needs, and gave residents a ticket to present to Mrs. Drexel for fulfillment. As the girls grew older, they were encouraged to begin a Sunday school in their home for the children of their father's employees. In making and teaching these sessions, Kate grew devoted to St. Francis of Assisi and was determined to follow his example by giving all to the poor. Her devotion to Jesus was clear to the family, and she considered a religious vocation, although she dreaded the thought of community life. Mrs. Drexel was diagnosed with cancer and Kate learned about suffering as her nurse for three years. After her death, the grieving family traveled to Europe together. Kate made a private vow of celibacy for one year at St. Mark's in Venice. In Rome, a bishop and priest fascinated the family with stories about serving on Native American reservations. Mr. Drexel took the girls on a business trip out west where they witnessed reservation life with their own eyes. Kate, wanting to help, used $100 of her allowance to purchase a Marian statue for a mission church that didn't have one. Although she was afraid to tell her father about this purchase, when he found out, he put his hand on her shoulders and said, I'm glad you did, Katie. It was a good thing. Mr. Drexel died two years after his wife in 1885. The funeral revealed his will, written to protect the girls from speculating suitors. Kate and her sisters received a generous income for the rest of their lives. Ten percent of Mr. Drexel's fortune was to be donated to his favorite charities. In the mid to late 1880s, the Drexel sisters again went west at the invitation of their spiritual director, Bishop O'Connor. Kate began building schools, providing food and clothing, and paying salaries for teachers on Native American reservations. She also searched for priests to serve the people. Still, she severely grieved the loss of her father. Her sisters, worried about Kate's health, decided to travel together to Europe. While Kate was cared for at a spa, 
the sisters spent weeks visiting institutions to learn about administration. They continued traveling, and in a private papal audience in Rome, Kate requested of Pope Leo XIII that he send missionaries to staff Native American schools. He responded, Why not, my child, yourself become a missionary? This rocked her to the core. She became convinced of this vocation and was further consoled by the news of her sister's plans to marry. Kate entered the Sisters of Mercy in Pittsburgh with the understanding that in two years she would found her own order, the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament for Indians and Colored People, today simply called Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament. Her sister Louise's dedication to serving African Americans had inspired her to add this to her mission. In late 1889, she received the religious habit and the name Sister Mary Catherine. Elizabeth Drexel married in January 1890 and became pregnant on an extended honeymoon. She returned ill. She and her child died in September. Bishop O'Connor, too, died that year, leaving Kate wondering how she could manage to fulfill her grand vocation. Her own bishop offered his support. In 1891, along with 13 other women, she established the new order and they immediately faced threats of violence. Dynamite sticks were found at the laying of their house's cornerstone. The sisters opened schools for Black and Native American youth, including training and vocational skills for economic advancement. Due to the reality of politics and racism, Mother Catherine knew that some Southern states would force segregation between Black and white sisters and create obstacles to the order's mission she decided to refrain from accepting black sisters, praying that these women would instead join orders for black sisters which had already been established. Her life had taken a drastic turn when she'd vowed poverty. She used every resource to its last, wearing clothes with patches on top of patches and shoes with holes. Taking away the pencils of her school students and replacing them with new ones, she used the old ones down to the nub. In 1915, aware of the lack of Catholic education in the South, she decided to build a school in New Orleans. But because of her legacy for building colored schools, she knew she'd likely be denied a property that interested her. So she sent a priest to survey it, and then she purchased it through a male agent. Once the reason for the purchase was discovered by locals, the building's windows were smashed. Still, it opened as Southern University of New Orleans, and in 1917, it became Xavier University. The school was focused on the education and formation of Black teachers. Many of its graduates went on to teach at Black Catholic parochial schools. Xavier is now the only historically Black Catholic university in the United States and the first Catholic university founded by a saint. Another major project was Mother Catherine's decision to fund the successor of Lucy Eaton Smith, the founder of the Dominican Sisters of St. Catherine de Ricci, to care for Afro-Cuban children in in Havana, Cuba, during and after the Spanish-American War. As a result of the war, many children had been orphaned, with no other church or government entity willing to support them because of their ethnic background. So busy at work was Mother Catherine in reviewing and fulfilling requests for aid that she had neither the time nor inclination to supervise her projects. This resulted in very few conflicts with bishops. She rather preferred to spend her time speaking and acting against racist practices. In 1927, she was interviewed by the manager of the Associated Press and argued against the mistreatment of African Americans. She also attempted to spark interest in failed anti-lynching bills, including one after Claude Neal's 1934 mob lynching in Florida. Each Blessed Sacrament convent superior asked President Roosevelt to revisit the bill. While her work was plagued by the Ku Klux Klan and other racist groups and individuals, Mother Catherine found her strength in the Eucharist. She said, In Holy Communion, the life of God, in a particular way, is imparted to my soul. 
It is there that God becomes the soul of my soul, to do, to suffer, all for love of him who died for you. And if you are for me, if you are with me, what can I fear, O my God? In 1935, Mother Catherine had a severe heart attack and suffered declining health in the following years. Another mother superior was elected in 1937, and Catherine's activities were limited to the mother house. She once exclaimed, Oh, how far I am at 84 years of age from being an image of Jesus in his sacred life on earth. Finally bedridden, she was able to have daily Mass celebrated in her room. Mother Catherine devoted these seemingly limited years to praying for the success of her sister's work. She passed away at the ripe old age of 96 years. The two miracles which enabled her canonization were related to the healing of a little boy's inner ear and then of a 17-month-old girl's deafness. Pope John Paul II made Mary Catherine Drexel the second American-born canonized saint on October 1, 2000. In 2018, her body was solemnly transferred to the Philadelphia Cathedral, where she and her Drexel sisters had donated an altar in honor of their parents. Here are two of her pieces of wisdom. Peacefully do at each moment what at that moment ought to be done. If we do what each moment requires, we will eventually complete God's plan, whatever it is. We can trust God to take care of the master plan when we take care of the details. She also said, If we wish to serve God and love our neighbor well, we must manifest our joy in the service we render to him and them. Let us open wide our hearts. It is joy which invites us. Press forward and fear nothing. Wow, what a story. Here are a few questions for you to ponder. What struck you about what you just heard? What stood out to you in the story? How does the life of this role model of faith teach and challenge you in your spiritual life? And what lesson will you take with you into your daily life? Please leave a comment on the YouTube post that corresponds to this episode, the podcast app you listen to this episode on, or you can send us an email to ministry at pilgrimcenterofhope.org. We look forward to hearing what you have to say. You can also download a printable pamphlet with this story, as well as a card with a quote from this month's saint on our website, pilgrimcenterofhope.org. The link will be included in the podcast description. And the quote that we have for you is, let us open wide our hearts. It is joy which invites us. Press forward and fear nothing. St. Catherine, pray for us. And we're so grateful to Chris and Patty Parma for sponsoring this social with the saints. And we thank you for joining us. We invite you to come visit Pilgrim Center of Hope and learn more about our threefold ministry of events, pilgrimages, and outreach You can also see how you can support us and sponsor an upcoming Social with the Saints at pilgrimcenterofhope.org or call us 210-521-3377. That's 210-521-3377. Please make sure to stay up to date with details about these wonderful events, and you can do so by liking our Pilgrim Center of Hope Facebook page, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our email list by visiting our website, pilgrimcenterofhope.org. Until next time, remember, we are a pilgrim people, and on your journey, you are never alone in the communion of saints. May God bless you. Thank you.